Welcome to the Autosportradio.com 2020 show. We are still at the Grant King Race Shops in Speedway, or in uh, Indianapolis, at 8155 Crawfordsville Road. You can see each, every so often we change backgrounds, and you see all these cars behind me. You've got some of the early Grant King sprint cars. There's all kinds of things to see here. So if you get a chance when things open up, come on down. But before you come down, be sure and call and let them know you're coming. So they'll have the shop open. The number is 317-820-3595. Today's show is presented by Honda and Honda HPD, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the NTT IndyCar Series, SVRA, and McGilvery's Pub and Eatery and Speedway. And incidentally, their, their patio is open for dining from uh, noon until 10 o'clock at night. So stop on by. Founded in 1993 to spear Honda's entry into IndyCar racing, Honda Performance Development has overseen the successful racing efforts at all the levels of the sport from karting and quarter midgets to IndyCar and prototype sports cars. HPD offers race engines and competition products for professional, amateur, and entry-level racers. For more information about HPD and the company's racing product lines, please visit hpd.honda.com. I want to thank uh, the Speedway Cable people for editing this video we get do all the time. Thank them for getting it done and getting it done them timely. If you ever have a problem with your computer, I do almost on a daily basis. We have a new computer guy, A plus affordable computer doctor. And Steve Fries is a doctor. He makes house calls. Call him up, call him the problem, see what he can do to help you. The number is 317-328-0766. Get the guys uh, need your, your favorite doctor's visit, a dentist. Do yourself a favor, go to the Indy Dental Group. Indy veteran Dr. Jack Miller and his wife, Dr. Liz Lewis, have one of the top practices in the state. Call them up, make an appointment. You'll be glad, trust me. 317-846-6125. If you'd like to go on an outing and you're in Florida or can get to Florida, take a corporate group or you can take your kid. You want to find out if they know, have the capability of driving, want to learn, go to the Anderson Race Park in Palmetto, Florida. It's a good place to go to corporate events, individual training, got repairs in case you hit a fence, everything you need. So check it out. If you've wondered why do these guys and gals want to drive high speed open wheel cars? Well, you can take a ride in one and find out for yourself in the Indy Racing Experience two seater. You can go to IndyRacingExperience.com and find a date that works for you and in the promo box put DK1, you get a 50% discount. Or you can call Sean in the office. Number is 317-243-7171. If it's time to insure your home, your car, or your per, uh, commercial property, do what most of us have done. Call Mike Pardee at DP Insurance. He's located at 5004 West 16th Street in Speedway. Call him up. Tell him what you're looking for, what you need, and he'll help you. Guaranteed. Number is 317 317- Two four eight zero zero seven zero. That's Mike Party at VP Insurance. And if you are uh, into the vintage cars and Trans Am, you can get a great publication, Speed Tour. Just go to svra.com and subscribe to Speed Tour. First class magazine, great stories, great pictures, something you need to have. And while you're there, look up the schedule since theirs has changed like a lot of other series find out what their upcoming events are, and you want to get to one if it's anywhere nearby. They're fabulous. And if you have a vintage car or are looking for one, you need, need a restoration on one, the uh, Grand King Shops can help you. Call them up, tell them what you have and need fixed or what you'd like to get. They can help you on both sides. The number is 317-820-3595. Well, my guest today is a friend of mine that uh, when I started Autosport and Speedway, he was my first... Victor, I mean, uh, associate. He is the son of a two-time 500 winner, and he has uh, got a varied background. You'll find it very interesting. Please welcome my friend, Mr. Roger Ward, Jr. Raj, how are you? Uh, I feel like a million. Thank you, John. How are you today? Fantastic. Now, we're speaking to you. Know, to you look great, and that shop looks great, but I don't think uh, Grant didn't build that Miller, did he? I'm not sure. Most of what's here is a lot of it is, is his cars, are his cars. Uh, but I got gotcha. you. There was a fire. There was a fire here. Uh, and if you were here when Grant had it, 
it doesn't look anything like this does. I mean, it's clean, it's spotless, it sparkles. It didn't used to be that way, but after they rebuild it, they've got all the equipment, the original is still here, but much nicer. Good place to visit. When you come to town, have you been here since they've opened it? I have not, I have yeah. not. Used to be a good place to get a nice cold past blue ribbon. Well, on occasion I heard that happen, yes. <laughs> So how are things in Manhattan Beach in my favorite restaurant, the uh, uh, fish bar? Well, gradually the town seems to be opening back up. Uh, we got news yesterday that now our barbers and hairdressers are back to work. That's been amazing because, the, because everybody here has been walking around with locks over their ears. <laughs> but uh, uh, town's opening up a little bit at a time. And uh, I, I think the local population is, we're pretty anxious. You know, uh, we've got this beautiful beach that they had closed down for a while. In fact, I posted a photograph once on my uh, Facebook that said something I've never seen before. And that was the beach without one footprint anywhere or one person anywhere on the beach. So that was pretty crazy. Uh, it's kind of like, I just was in Las Vegas uh, two weeks ago and no cars around any casinos. That was just totally bizarre. So uh, we've seen stuff we've never ever seen before, but thank the Lord we're uh, uh, sort of beginning to recover from all of that. Now, as I introduced you, and as people know, you are Roger Ward Jr. You are the son of a two time winner. You were 17 when your dad won the first one. Did you really realize what he had accomplished? Well, only because uh, uh, he, of course, started the, his first race was in 1951. And uh, we knew how exciting it was and what the, the net effect would be, but never realized how uh, winning that race would change all of our lives for indelibly and forever. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I think even... Uh, uh, his great grandchildren now are are seeing uh, some of the results of that. You know, he was an interesting guy. I I, I was at the race when he won the second. So time. I guess in answer to your question, we didn't realize. Uh -oh. Yeah, that was a big day. That was a big day. Uh, I was there for that one. I didn't get to be there in 1959, but yeah, that was a great day. Um, how did that affect you personally? Did you Our think you were cool? Your dad was a champion? A well, I think I've confessed this before. Uh, the night of the, the victory, or the night, of, not of the victory banquet, but the night of the race, we all up ended up at a place called Shannon's Roaring Twenties. And uh, the party went on, and I thought, gee whiz, it's almost 2 o'clock. I better get another drink. And the next thing you know, they just kept drinking, and that party stayed on until about 4 in the morning. Over on Meridian, Shannon's Roaring Twenties. <laughs> you know, your dad is still remembered uh, because there are guys that used to race against him. And I, um, Ann Fernaro, Fernaro, who was... AJ's PR gal for, for many years um, had a thing going, uh, start off with Ask AJ, now it's Ask Larry. And one of the questions that he, AJ was asked is, who are some of the toughest guys you ever raced against? And if I'm not mistaken, the first one he said was your dad. He said he was a clean racer, but he was tough, very tough to race and beat. Well, you know, you get a guy like A.J. Foyt Pena, those kinds of compliments, that's uh, uh, a, a real stamp of approval and, and indelible. Um, A.J. and Parnelli and my dad and, and that, that bunch of guys in those days uh, uh, were awesome. Parnelli is the best race driver I ever saw, uh, even better than my dad, I think. But but, uh, and, and probably every bit as good as H.J. Ford. He just, he won his money and got advised that he should get out of the sport, you know what I mean, to save his, to, to prevent from getting hurt. Uh, but I think had he been around longer, he would have won more. But uh, 
Uh, yeah, that that's quite a compliment. You know, another person that my dad, in fact, in, in the 62 race, uh, my dad and AJ were talking and, and Troy Rutman's name came up. And uh, my dad said, boy, I sure wouldn't want to have to race him in equal equipment. So Troy Rutman was another very tough race driver in those days. Uh, it, you know, it, it's interesting. Quite frequently in, in other sports, a son follows in the father's footsteps and, and has sometimes as good or close to as good success. You uh, didn't exactly follow your dad, although you did race, and I think in motocross, you won a championship out in California at one time. Yeah, three-wheel motorcycle championship in the 70s. That was kind of cool. Um, but, you know, I, I, I was, you know, I, I, I was, I, I didn't have the kind of maturity or focus that would be required to be a race driver. Um, you know, you take a guy like Gary Bettenhausen, he, he would rather race than eat. Uh, uh, we know a lot of people that are living in uh, very moderate uh, small homes that could be living in mansions if they hadn't fitted all of their money away on their race cars. <laughs> so, uh, uh, in fact, I've got, I, I've got a few friends that the, the, the racing bug bit them so badly that uh, – They've ended up going through a wife or two and because all they cared about was driving that race car. I, that, that never bit me quite that strongly or I didn't have the maturity to move on in that direction. Uh, misspent youth, you might say. But, but uh, I certainly had the opportunities. Uh, I just never took advantage of them. And, and you know, I, there's race drivers that I thought would never uh, – can you say piss a drop sure. uh, on radio? Anyway, there were race drivers that I thought would never amount to a hill of beans that, that really moved on and matriculated into some great race. And I didn't think, I didn't think Michael Andretti was going to win a race, but boy, oh boy, was I wrong there. <laughs> uh, you, know, you have two brothers, Dave and, and Rick, and Rick drove for quite a while. Rick was a, a pretty good race driver. You know, it's just a matter of didn't have enough money to to keep a race car together. And you know, when you when you're you, you take a guy like Tony Stewart, Tony would eat, drink, and sleep his race car. Uh, all of all of us, uh, my family had slightly different priorities when my brother david was driving a midget um uh and, and driving, driving race cars for other people he he had a wife and and had to buy her a car and and uh uh you know tony stewart didn't have a wife he wasn't buying anybody a car he was going to spend <laughs> that money on a new right rear you know it was just that the, the difference in in having a a, a total focus on making that race car go faster. And, you know, in those days, if you were running seventh and had a chance to finish sixth, that might be another 60 bucks in the pay uh, envelope, which might mean the difference between sleeping between the tires on the fenders of the, or, you know, on the trailer of the race car or sleep, sleeping in a motel, uh, you know, eating cheeseburgers or having a, you know, a prime rib dinner. So, I mean, a lot of the, you know, it, 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 those people had total tunnel vision to drive in a race car when, when, you know, we just didn't have that. I didn't, at least. Well, your dad retired fairly early, it seems to me. My brother um, David? No, your, your dad. Oh, oh. Uh, last race was 66, you know. Uh, uh, if he have stayed out there, he could have won that race. But the, the race car was was uh, mishandling, and and the race and the racetrack itself. I think they <laughs> two or three race cars had blown their engines completely and oiled her down. The thing was as slick as it could possibly be, and uh, you know it scared him, and he quit in '66. I don't remember how old he was, but yeah, 
yeah. I, I, there's not too many race drivers around nowadays that are in their late 40s, is there? Well, there's a couple. Uh, uh, Kanan is getting into it. I think he's in the early 40s or something. I don't know. I don't pay attention. You know to what? That. A, what a what a great champion that guy has been. But you know, I like these. I like the new names. You know, I I'd like to see Sage Karam get another shot at it. Some you know some of these new young studs, man. Yeah, well, Colton Hurd has accounted for of himself fairly well so far. So it'll be interesting to see oh, how it goes. Man, what a rocket ship that kid is. Yeah. Wow. And he's born of a great. His dad was a great race driver too. He was a really good race driver, I should say. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The herd of family, that's another good one. You know, your dad had it in his mind for a lot of years that he was responsible for uh, Bill Vukovic's crash, which turned out to be not true at all. He had nothing to do with it, but he thought, if I remember right, he thought he did. Well, there were a couple of incidents in my father's career that uh, were devastating to him. Clay Smith getting killed over in, uh, in Illinois in a dirt race, you know, when my dad lost it coming off of four and went through the pits and, the, and a mechanic got killed. Uh, his, uh, you know, the, the, the axle broke on uh, the car that uh, where Vuki ran over my dad's right rear and then ended up out into the into the, the walkover bridge down the back straightaway. That was terrible. Um, there were a few things like that that, that occurred in his career. But, um, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, he was, you know, when, when, when the science came out or when the, the observations finally came out, you know, my dad was pretty well reconciled to that. But, yeah, there were a few of those kinds of situations where guys got hurt. But gee whiz, if you look inside those race cars, no wonder they got hurt, man. Those <laughs> things are scary. I mean, if you look at the the oil on the feet of Vuki, I think it is, uh, in some of the pictures that have been out there lately, I mean, he was virtually being sprayed with hot oil on his feet the whole race. And some of those guys wear blisters that were that bleed in their hands, you know, where you and I would be moving our hands back. Those guys just held on and weren't focused. Parnelli got hit in the face with a rock one time big enough to there was blood running out his out or out his 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 hanky was over his face was just all blood red. So you know those guys were tough. One time after a race at Ileana where my dad did a match race with Bettenhausen. <clears throat> In the shower after the race underneath the grandstand, my dad was taking a shower and there were little strawberries, little cherries all over his arms, you know what I mean? Just, and around the tops of his shoulders where the windshield didn't cover him. And I said, what are all of those red marks? He says, ah, that's when you get hit with the dirt. So, I mean, he's getting, you know, it's like somebody shooting, shooting marbles at you with a slingshot. You know, so yeah, yeah, those guys were tough, man. Oh, my yeah. father cut himself one time at my house, was bleeding bad. It was a nasty cut in a place that really hurt. And I just ignored it. You know, he just had no, he had a very high tolerance for pain, which I think is required in driving those old cars. <laughs> You're not kidding. Now, your dad essentially could have won, had the potential to have won four times. Well, if you want to listen to our side of the story, he could have been fact time winner. You know, he, he won her in 59, and that was pretty conclusive. He could have won, and it was his mistake that he didn't win in 60. Uh, in 61, uh, uh, if he'd known that Foyt was going to run out of gas and that the Sachs was going to have – tire problems or whichever it was I can't remember exactly but you know he would have he could have kept up to those guys he just couldn't pass them so he just you know sort of just dialed it back and settled for third but had he known he could have stayed up with them that would have been another win 62 he did win 63 we were out to lunch completely 64 was another driver's mistake uh short circuit between the seat and the steering wheel we like to say <laughs> 
Anyway, that was uh, uh, another thing where the lean rich mixture didn't uh, happen properly. And, uh, or, well, my dad had it confused and they literally wrote in chalk on the dashboard, uh, lean up and up was that up was up forward or was up straight up. So that got confused and they, we had five pit stops and finished second. Um, and then in 66, if he'd have just stayed out there, he'd have won. <coughs> so we had a, a few chances to win the, the race that, that we didn't win. But I think in Indianapolis is a lot like other huge events, like the Daytona 500. The guy that wins is the guy that makes the – he's fast but makes the fewest mistakes. And, uh, you know, let's face it, we've seen that at the Speedway a myriad times, you know. J.R. Hildebrand, huh? There's a, there's a, there'd be a pass. He'd be a winner if he didn't just fall asleep coming out of four, you know, coming for this checkered flag of all oh, things. Yeah. Well, I had your dad and Jim Rathman as guests one night together. And we were talking around and I said, uh, you know, you had an opportunity to win the race that Jim won. He said, yeah. He said, but it, and he, if I remember right, he had tire problems. Your dad did. And he had right to pull front, in yeah. and get tires, but he caught him again. And he said, if this guy had been a gentleman, he'd have let me go by him because he knew I was faster. Exactly. But he didn't do it. So he could have won that race easily because he was quick, no question about it. But the tire problem got him. And as a result, I think he finished second there too. Yeah, yeah, that that was uh, the 60 race. That was kind of a, it was a fun day. We were sure we were going to win that one in 64. I was cleaning my shoes off at lap 120, thinking I didn't want it to look good in victory lane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what? I just I just read the other day where Toddy Rutman puts on her Facebook page that uh, that that Troy's win had uh, fabric showing through on the right front. I didn't know that before. Uh, be interesting to find out, you know, just how severe that was. But yeah, yeah. Let's, those those tires you could see through what you could see what was going on. Right. You know, for years, Billy DeVore used to sit in an observation stand between three and four on a little platform where he was no more than maybe ten feet above the race cars where they ran almost ran right underneath him. And he sat there with binoculars watching for tire blistering because that would be you know a, a a black stripe would show up around the, around the tire if the the if they were starting to blister or delaminate and uh billy divorce sat there there was a, a a tire observer for probably 10 years in a row there at the speedway uh you know among other things your dad was good behind the wheel of a car and if i remember right and i don't remember the year he he ran a midget against some of the finest sports car drivers in the world and he won the race he beat them all that was amazing lime rock connecticut yeah, was lime rock. exactly the perfect uh race tr car a race track uh to run a midget chris economaki called ken bren from new jersey or New York, Pennsylvania, someplace back in the East Coast, and said that Roger Ward would like to go do this race, blah, blah, blah. Are you interested? And, and Chris Economaki put them together, and off they went. And there was uh, 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 George Constantine Gurney was there. Uh, all of the the the, the Mexicans, uh, uh, Rodriguez, Pedro Rodriguez, and his uh, brother Ricardo, they were there. In fact, <clears throat> the story is that, and Robin Miller told this story that the Rodriguez brothers uh, made this beautiful trophy for the winner of that race, dead certain that when they got there, they were gonna win it. <laughs> <laughs> when my dad beat him in the midget, they took the trophy home. They didn't give it to him. <laughs> I've got the I've got the plaque in my uh, in my well, I call it my room. It's 
combination laundry room and where I brush my teeth in the, <laughs> in the back of my place here. Anyway, uh, uh, I've got that the, the trophy from Lime Rock, and it says it says the best performance by an American-made car. Little did they know we were going to just blow their doors off, man. It was fabulous. We ran another race. In fact, we tried it one time with one of Wilkie's midgets at uh, IRP. And I think we ran, we got like a third overall with two heats going on. But that was, like I said, that was George Constantine, the, 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 the Mexican favorites, uh, uh, Dan Gurney, uh, Reven Lance Reventlo, uh, Augie Paps. You know, there's a bunch of great race drivers. It's, it's interesting to hear your dad and the hist history of him and people still remember him, still talk about him. If you talk to the veteran drivers that ran against him, they all admired what he did and, and had great respect for him. What maybe a lot of people don't know is, although you were involved in motorsports and racing for quite a number of years, you branched off and got into electronics and have and turned that into a very successful business. Although you followed racing and were involved you know, in it and have been around it your entire life, your business, and it turned out to be a cleverly named Forward Electronics, or a hugely successful business. Well, you know, you asked me how my dad's win had an effect on my life. Um, I met a man who uh, was the president of a couple of printed circuit board companies, printed circuit boards. My, my family thought I was selling surf boards at the time. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I met a man who was uh, a big race fan and wanted to go to the Indy 500 and wanted to go to Daytona and wanted to go here and there. And, and he hired me uh, only because of, of my dad. He, you know, his wife said, Roger, make a good salesman. And so he, he hired me. But I, I met him at the Ontario Motor Speedway. Uh, uh, in the late sixties. And, uh, he was the one that started me in, in, in the selling printed circuit boards. So that was a life changing thing for me. And, and of course, then I ended up opening my own business, but heck, I, I mean, I can, I can't even be, one time I called a guy up in Chicago, a dear friend named Jerry Foster from, uh, he's down in Scottsdale now, or no, no, Gilbert. Any Gilbert, Arizona. Anyway, uh, I called him up on the phone and I said, hello, my name is Roger Ward. I'm with Forward Electronics. I'd like a chance to talk to you about your excess inventory. And he said, Roger Ward? I said, yeah. He says, well, I'm Jim Rathman. Well, that meant not did he just hear of Roger Ward because people would say, oh, yeah, I'm A.J. Foyt or I'm Mario Andretti or I'm Parnelli Jones, another famous name. But because he said Jim Rathman, you knew that he knew the, 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 the history of the 60 race. He knew um, uh, how close the race was. And, he, you know, you had to be a, a race fan to, to know that little bit of esoteric information. Anyway, uh, I ended up doing business with him and bringing him to the race probably 15 times. So yeah, yeah, the, 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 the answer of how my life has changed as a result of my dad's career, uh, it, it, that answer just goes on and on and on forever. It just keeps going on. Well, I used to come out to your shop when we first started doing auto sport. <clears throat> and I listened to you say, oh, I got a call, I got to take it. And somebody would call you and they're looking for 10,000 something or others for a computer. You'd say, yeah, let me check. I'll get back to you. And then you'd make a call somewhere and you'd negotiate a price. You get, you buy these parts for 15 cents. And you call the guy back and say, I got them for you. And I got the best price I can get for you. And you quoted him a price. I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. Uh, and in fact, I was in your office the day that you hit your million dollars in sales. And it's a good thing the roof was, our ceiling was as high as it was, or you'd have been through it. But you jumped up and down, we did it, we cracked the million dollars in sales. That was kind of fun to have been there to see that. 
Well, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that was, uh, <laughs> those are the good old days, man. And they're the days that are responsible for my, me living in the lap of luxury now. Ooh. Well, if you want to call this the lap of luxury, but I'm, I'm living the life I'm living thanks to those days, and thanks to my dad, and thanks to you, in fact, for your support and friendship over the years. Well, for those who don't know where you live in Manhattan Beach, he lives on a road. It's a block and a half from the Pacific Ocean shore. Six houses. Says, I'm sorry? It's six houses. All right, six houses, block and a half or something like that. But you can walk out his front door, or look out his living room window, and you can see the Pacific Ocean. You can hear so, it. Yeah, and you can hear it at night. I've stayed there a number of times, and you can hear it. We'd open the windows just so we could hear it. Um, what are you doing today? I know you play golf and you said you're getting better at, since playing since you're 18 years old. You're ready for the senior tour now. You're really good. And you fish. I fish a lot. I, and I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm no good at golf and I do a lot more fishing than I do catching. That's for sure. <laughs> but I love to walk down this, the hill. with. I've got like a, a 10 foot rod that's you know set up for casting past the waves and i like to do surf fishing uh, a friend of mine i'm a partner in a, a a small fishing boat and i mean when i say a fishing boat it's there's no place to sit there's it that's it's for fishing and uh not for polishing or waxing or cleaning it's for fishing <laughs> and uh my my partner in that boat wanted to go to catalina uh monday uh, but the, it was just a little too windy, so we didn't go because you know I'm, you know I'm too lazy to be beaten up for an hour's ride coming back. It would have been smooth going over, but it would have been kind of nasty coming back. So I'm glad that we didn't go. But uh, yeah, I've caught a 305 pound uh, bluefin tuna. Uh, I've caught some 35 pound yellowtail and. Uh, a lot, lot of lot of fish out of the surf here. It's a lot of fun. It's I love doing it, and my golf game. I'm as bad now as I was when I was 18. It that doesn't seem to change. <laughs> it's all in your mind, you know. And uh, well, you're the golf right. gods aren't uh, aren't aren't uh, they're not tolerant of my attention deficit syndrome. You know, you're, just, you're just out there for the fun anyway. You're not looking to break par. You're just out to have a good time. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I love to, you know, the guys that I play with on Saturday, you know, if you hit one into the weeds, they all say, that a boy, good job, Rod. You know, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, there's, it's as much uh, uh, kibitzing and 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 wisecracking and smart ass talking and it's as much that as anything i told a guy the other day he says he was hitting one of them yellow balls and there is a they had that blue stuff in the water to keep the more the moss from forming and i said i wonder what one of them yellow balls looked like in that blue water <laughs> and sure enough man he jerked it right into that pond we all had a good laugh on that one so yeah yeah that's that's what it is. My brother David plays with us almost every oh, Wednesday. Yeah. Too. Well, that's good. Um, something that maybe some of our viewers aren't aware of, the last, I think, four or five years, you became a pastor, and you had two churches out, one on New Ross, and I forget where the, I mean, these are little towns that would fit in your pocket. And you came in and took over, and they were, you know, when you on Sunday morning, you could count the people with one whisk. By the time you left, it was standing room only. And I know that because I went to a couple of your services before you left. And, and I'm sure there are people saying, where's Roger? Why isn't he here? You know, that's a kind of a job where I, I, I just almost don't know uh, how you ever retire from it. But in my personal set of circumstances, uh, I, lo I lost the zest for it, you know, I, uh, I, I wasn't, I, I, we did a good job, uh, June and I together, uh, she was choir director at, at the church towards the end, and uh, we ended up doing that for 16 years, we were eight, eight years in uh, 
uh, Amo and Coatesville, uh, two little churches there, and, and they were quite literally ready to close. Um, but, you know, I've got enthusiasm, plus there again, my dad's name. You know, you guys want to go, this guy's the son of the two-time winner, you know. So people would be attracted to come to my churches uh, because of my dad's name. So there's another uh, thing that his legacy afforded me. But anyway, uh, I I'm a believer, man. I've got God in my heart and Christ in my in my soul, and I I. I I, I'm a prayer. I, I, I pray even for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, uh, what, what a blessing uh, to have been able to to uh, bring other people uh, into a relationship with our Lord. It's a, it's a blessing to do that because you know it's true. It it, it works. It's. Um, uh, we have habits that we developed back in those days of uh, daily time of devotion, and and uh, uh, it makes a difference when you stop and kind of center yourself a little bit, and and uh, uh, remember who made you and 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 who has shown grace to you in your lives. I mean. Uh, uh, where I am and what I'm doing now is is a direct result of of, of you know, it's the sum. It, it's the it, it's it's a cum, cumulative effect on where we are in our lives today, and 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 truly with an attitude of gratitude. You know, we are we are so thankful for all that we've done. Doesn't mean I don't get to act like a jackass from time to time. <laughs> That's you know that kind of just goes with my territory. But I had a beautiful, lovely, loving, caring Christian wife and. And, uh, yeah, I don't deserve any of this, man. I'm just way over the top with, with being thankful. That's for sure. You know, it's, it, it's just, as I was listening and have been listening to you and all the things that as a result of your dad have happened to you, you think the same thing would have happened if he didn't name you Louis Ward? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Geez, I remember my first year at Firestone, man. I would that was back in the days when they had those telephone booths there on the yeah. west end of the garage. Yeah. This day. Roger Ward Jr. telephone call booth number three. Oh God. <laughs> you know, I mean I got made fun of so much and plus I was complete wild ass and so, you know, it just was just goofy. It was crazy back in the, in them days, man. And, I worked with some great people, uh, Jack Miller, Bob Bob Cassidy, who just passed away over 100. He was 100 years old, that guy, or was he 90 something? Uh, anyway, so. with Cass and all those guys, Charlie Prophet, bunch of great people that were very kind to me and and, and got cared for me. And Charlie the Neal Prophet. brothers, man, they were McCrary's brothers-in-law, and that was another gas. <laughs> and of course, Charlie Prophet was uh, worked for Goodyear. Well, he was with Firestone when I started yeah, initially, there. Yeah. yeah. And then he ended up in the barn over in the uh, southeast corner forever. And Isn't I, I, that ironic? Thing. You go over to the Mo a Speedway Motel and you walk into the lounge and by golly, there was Charlie. I don't know how he got all the way over there, but he managed to make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You kind of relocate yourself. I spent a lot of days, at, uh, you know, a lot of mornings after staying up half the night i'd go into the locker room and take a shower and keep i kept the fire the fresh firestone uniform in my golf locker <laughs> those are the days and we survived it now i you've had a few health issues one not not as uh, easy when you, you you have had a heart attack but i talked to you a couple months ago and you said did you know i had a stroke no i didn't know that uh, how are you doing? Obviously, you look well. You're sounding well. Um, actually, the last thing I had was the heart attack. Uh, and uh, there's no no symptoms. No, I, you know, my doctor asked me how I'm doing, and I'm asymptomatic. I feel good. Now, they have me taking some pills. I'm on blood thinners and this and that. I have AFib. Yeah, I got uh, that. 
uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I had a, I had a TIA one time and I told my boys at the, at the restaurant, the coffee shop, you know, where we used to eat breakfast in North Salem. <clears throat> I said, I had a TIA and the guys, oh, hell, I have one of those every week. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, you know, I'm not alone with this affibrillation, um, but, uh, June and I just took a 25 day road trip. We're going to take another one. Uh, I fish, I golf, I do everything I did. I walk a mile a day. Um, do some, I do push ups, but they're girls' push ups. You know, they're not the kind of you're on your toes, you're on your knees. So I do that kind of stuff and walk the dog and uh, stay pretty active. Pretty active. Loving it. Loving life. Well, yeah, in fact, when my doctor told me that, you know, I, well, when I got to the news about what was going on with my heart and all that, I said, don't give me that crap, man. I says, I'm in the pay line, man. I don't, <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't tell me, I, you know, things are coming to the close. You know, I'm, I need to keep going. I've lost some weight and I still eat like, uh, I don't eat healthy, but uh, you're here. down to about 185 pounds and you're having fun that's the whole secret to the whole thing enjoy what you're doing and for for roger to walk a mile it wouldn't take much he walked down the hill to the beach and to get to the i forget whatever the main street name i can't remember the name of it but to get there would be equivalent to a mile walk because it's uphill ah yeah that's from the strand uh, up to the house, it's pretty steep. You're right. Yeah. You know my old dog, man. She's 11. She doesn't. She doesn't like that walk either. <laughs> well, you know, it, it it it's a shame that last weekend came and passed, and there was not a race. Uh, there will be a. Did you watch the televised uh, program they put on Sunday? Nah. No, it was good. It was, it was really quite good. And I thought the analyzation of the race and things that you see but don't pay that much attention to because it goes poof and it's over it was very interesting to see and get analyzed. So I, I enjoyed it. I watched the sim racing and thought, well, this is kind of silly. But after I watch it, but holy smoke, that they have this thing set so during the course of the race and when they ran the 500 a simulated race, they have tire wear on the track. They have tire temperature changes on the track. Uh, they, you know, your tire degradation is monitored and you have to stop or your tires will blow on you. I mean, they have this thing set up. It's quite realistic. Sharon came in to watch it. She said, this is a real race. I said, no, it's not. It's a simulated race. Oh, no, because when the in-car camera, as they're going through a corner, you see the shadow over the driver's gloves and through the cockpit. How in the world they do that, I don't know. I don't know how they do any of it, to be serious about it. But I think uh, this uh, coming uh, uh, June the 6th will be an eye-opener for people. See a race. And it'll hopefully oh, man, get I things started. Wait. Have you got your gas tank filled up and you're ready to head here in August? Oh, we're going to leave before August, man. We're going <laughs> to be on the road now if it wasn't for the this corona stuff. You know, my first race was 61, and I didn't miss a race until 66 when I was in the military. I, I listened to that race in Athens, Greece. Uh, I flew out of Ankara over to Athens where I went to one of our strategic armament system sites, and they had uh, uh, really good radio reception from the United States. And so I flew, I flew over to Athens to, to listen to the race. Um, uh, found out two days later on the Stars and Stripes newspaper that my dad had retired. Um, so I missed the race in 66. And then one year in the middle 80s, uh, June and I, went to the Ray, went to Indiana, and did like so many people do that I know. Uh, Linda Beckley is one of them, you know, Patrick's sister, Jack's daughter. Uh, she'll come to Indianapolis. Uh, she'll be there for a week. She'll visit everybody. She'll stay for carburetor day. 
and then get on an airplane and go home and watch the race on television. Uh, uh, John Locke, after he got, after he was no longer active at Gene White, he didn't stay for the race. Um, uh, I did that one year, but man, I was driving down Georgetown Road, uh, looking at all the fans starting to arrive and all that other business. And we just, we decided that we weren't going to do that again. So we missed it in 85, but we haven't missed a race since. And uh, uh, it seemed abnormal. You know, in fact, when I, I was talking with you on the telephone, setting this thing up, when you were on the on the porch at McGillery's, man, I was Jones and so bad to be there and <laughs> to hear race cars and to, you know, to see the the Freedom 100, which has been as good a race as we've had all month long. Um, you know, just to see all of that stuff, it, it was, I, don't, I wouldn't want to say heartbreaking, but yeah, heartbreaking, you know. Um, you know, this is a, you know, Roger Penske, uh, the man I used to love to hate. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, he's truly a, 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 a hero and a champion uh, uh, of champions to take over this racetrack and improve it. You know, I'm sure that what he's done has just been awesome. And uh, it's too bad that he didn't get the break to have the race, uh, his first race uh you know on a memorial day weekend that that's kind of a, a a drag in a way but uh gee whiz you know with uh uh all of with with bulls and 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 miles and uh and, and penske i mean what a team uh of of uh of leaders and uh what a great opportunity for all of us race fans to watch this big way and, and our traditions grow. NASCAR beware. <laughs> well, when you get here and you, first time you walk in the track, I think you're going to be astounded at what you'll see. Well, hell, all you got to do is look at one of Roger Penske's used car lots, for God's sakes, man. Every car is lined up right on the button. <laughs> there's no, <laughs> you know, there's no helter skelter business going on in anything Roger Penske owns. And I'm sure the Speedway is going to be the same exact way. Oh, yeah. Made a lot of changes, a lot of updates. Um, the fact that, you know, the parking lot that used to be gravel across from Gate 1, uh, it's all been paved now. First thing he did when he took over or signed the contract, I guess, he put a flag out in front of the admin building. First, I think that was one of the first things he did was put a flagpole up there. Uh, it, it, you'll be impressed when you get here, and we look forward – Hopefully you'll be here in time. We can have uh, lunch a couple of times. Oh, absolutely. And, and continue telling stories. And if they're not true, so what? <laughs> Make them up as you go along. My dad used to do that. You know, every time he raced them races, man, he got better and faster. There was no <laughs> doubt about it. I remember many nights at my house in uh, Danville where my dad would literally be sitting at the table and there'd be guys all around the table and uh, – a standing room only in my kitchen listening to his his old stories it was great yeah. Fun. and it's amazing the number and he was surprised i asked him one day he's walking through the uh the back uh, behind the tower and people were stopping him for his autograph and a lot of them were young and i as he got by the media center i said does the attention surprise you he said are you kidding i never thought anybody would remember me but it's amazing. And he said, and the young kids that know who I am, I know what they're told by their parents, but they then know, and they come for an autograph. And he said, I love it. Well, you know what? My dad signed his autograph. You could read his name. Yes. He had nice yes. handwriting. He couldn't spell worth a damn, but he always got Roger Ward right. Yeah, somebody was telling me that they did uh, put something out on him. Oh, it was a ticket. Uh, he got a ticket when he was at on a flight. It was back in the time when they hand wrote the tickets and you got the carbon copy. And the guy wrote the ticket out and handed it to him because he knew who he was. And he, your dad walked away and pretty soon he came back and he said, not a problem. I just I tell you, my, my name has a D in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
And McCluskey didn't like it when you spelled his with a D in it. He was yeah. R-O-G-E-R. Yeah. Well, it's been great talking with you. It's been great. Uh, I, and I, I hope I don't embarrass you when somebody says, you know Roger Ward? I say, yeah, he's a friend of mine. I hope nobody's called you and said, boy, that's too bad. Sorry to hear about that. But it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Look forward to seeing you. Look forward to seeing you. Hopefully you'll bring June with you everywhere because that makes the visit worthwhile. Well, Don, thank you very much, man. You are a very dear friend to me. Uh, uh, you put up with me when I was acting like a jackass more than once. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of great radio programs together. Uh, I'm certainly glad that, uh, what we started continues. Uh, uh, and I have, uh, even watched you grow and mature in this position. And I just admire you so much for it. And, and I'm thankful. And let me say on behalf of the guys at McGillivray's and all of those old farts that come in there like me uh, during May and and on the Tuesdays when you have your show, let me just say thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for what you do for car racing, where you make it uh, something that's accessible and fun. And uh, damn, I, w I, you know, you have some programs that just knock me out. I want to be there for them. You know, it's just amazing. Well, hopefully we'll be back and uh, be able to do it from the McGilvery's again when you're here in August. We'll see what happens. Look forward to talking to you then. And thanks for the time. Thank June for allowing you to take the time and cancel your golf game today. I appreciate that. And we'll look forward to seeing you in August. Or All before. right. God, God bless you, my friend. God bless you. Thank you. My guest has been none other than Roger Ward Jr., who now goes by Roger Ward, I'm assuming. Uh, he's had quite a life and quite a career and, and just, just a good guy to know. And uh, we will be back again. We've got uh, some other programming we're looking at, so uh, we're not going to disappear. We'll be back soon. Until then, Don K. saying thanks for watching. Catch you the next time.